Go. Okay. So, chapters 18, 19, and 20 are the big picture chapters. One of the ways that this course is run is you go from small and really tiny, think about atoms and things like that, to bigger and bigger and bigger things, both conceptually as well as in reality. So even though we may have started with some very little things, then we built those into bigger things, and so now we're building things into the, the grand scheme of things. In fact, these three chapters are probably the ones that encompass most easily the kinds of things that you like to watch when you turn on Discovery Channel and uh, National Geographic and that kind of thing. And so as a consequence, you'll find that a lot of the things that we're dealing with in these chapters is perhaps a little bit more intuitive than some of the things that we've done in the past. Conceptually, this isn't so difficult because this is what surrounds you. The only thing is that just with anything in biology, you try to divvy it up so that when you actually start to learn about it, you don't have to learn about everything all at once, but you can learn about smaller components. And so the, the first part of this, chapter 18, deals with the science of ecology. Chapter 18 is one of the ecology chapters. And ecology is one of the things that really encompasses a lot of big picture kinds of things. And one of the things that I said already we need to do is break it down. So in terms of the levels involved in ecology, we can really differentiate five different levels. The book has four, but I like to add one. And so you'll see that in a minute. Now the first one of these levels would be the organismal level. And the organismal level is kind of the, the smallest unit of ecology, because in this you study a single organism. Now studying a single organism is great because logistically it is one of the things that's easiest for us to do. But studying a single organism may also be the most limiting in terms of the overall picture because obviously it's just one but we can actually learn a lot from just the one. Because if there is one, it will do all the things that most of the others will do. Now, it won't do them the same way, and it won't do them at the same time, but it will tend to feed. It will tend to reproduce. It will tend to move. So there are all these kinds of things that an individual organism does just as well as a group of organisms. And therefore, from the behavior and the activities of the one, you can often extrapolate and figure out what the many might do. And so a single organism, a single individual, will actually give us a lot of the information we'll need to then learn more about a group of organisms. Now once we get to that level, the group of organisms is called population ecology. And in population ecology, we're looking for groups of organisms that are of the same species, that's the first same, in the same area, at the same time. Same, same, same. Same species, same area, same time frame. And this is important because if you're learning about a population, you can really only take a snapshot. As we heard earlier, populations are the unit of evolution, and so populations are going to change over time. So if you wish to characterize a population, you have to do it in the here and now. And since we're dealing with a population, we're looking at the changes in the allele frequencies. That has to be within a species. And we need to look at it within a certain geographic area because otherwise we're starting to see the influence of evolution again. Immigration, emigration, genetic drift, and all those other things. And so it's very important to remember, same, same, same for the population level. <clears throat> now between the population level and this next level called community ecology, there's a huge jump in complexity. <coughs> because whereas here we're dealing with a number of organisms that are in uh, a, a way well established and easy to define. Now in a community, we're dealing with all the species. So all the species and their interactions. 
Uh, clearly, that is a lot more complicated because all the species are all composed of all kinds of populations, which are all composed of a lot of individuals. So you can see now we're dealing with much larger factors in how they influence themselves and each other. And so all species is where you would look at things like uh, food webs. Who eats whom? Who is the predator and who is the prey? Those kind of things are very critical when it comes to community ecology. It also helps a little bit with understanding um, that an individual organism isn't just going to eat one type of thing, but it actually has uh, a breadth of organisms it might eat. It allows us to differentiate whether an organism is an herbivore, carnivore, an omnivore, and so on. So there are all kinds of things that happen in a community that are just vastly more complex. In fact, one of the huge stumbling blocks for community ecology is to figure out, first of all, how many different things are there actually in the area? So diversity is a key aspect of the community. The fourth level is <coughs> ecosystem ecology. And in an ecosystem, what you're going to do is look at the biotic characteristics. The biotic characteristics are those created by the organisms that live in it. But you also have the abiotic which are environmental, meaning that these are the things that organisms do not influence. So this would be um, the quality of the soil, the temperature on a given day, how much precipitation there is, whether there's a storm coming. Those are abiotic factors and those are not influenced by the organisms themselves. So you have this as a large scale system where you could look at a desert ecosystem or you could look at a tropical rainforest ecosystem, the Antarctic ecosystem. So any of those would be large, very large scale things, and there you can look at things like energy flow. Where is the energy in that environment coming from primarily, and how does it flow through the environment? It also involves things like nutrient cycles. So water, in a rainforest, water has a slightly different meaning and a slightly different flow than it would in the desert. Water does flow in both, but in one it flows all the time, and in the other it flows much more regularly. And so those are things that help characterize these ecosystems. And you'll find very often it's intuitive to break up our studies of the world into some of these different ecosystems. You find it's relatively rare that somebody's going to make a documentary that's dealing with the desert and the rainforest. They usually pick one or the other just because each one in their own right is already very complex. The last one, and this is sort of one that's, I think, coming more and more into uh, the, the, the conscience of scientists. We never really looked at it this way because we just never really had the data. But satellite data show us that there actually is something called a biosphere level. The biosphere level of ecology deals with any kinds of global phenomena. Now, global phenomena have been observed for some time. The question is always, what exactly are the effects on the populations and on the, on the ecosystems? Uh, they include things like the El Nino and La Nina events in the Pacific Ocean. And they also include the large-scale volcanic eruptions and the concomitant weather changes. And so sometimes we've been able to measure these things, and it may have been a fluke when we were able to measure these things, but suddenly people realize, wow, there's something that's going on on the African continent that actually affects us in the Caribbean. One case in point, massive sandstorms in the Sahara Desert reach levels of the atmosphere where they actually get into a wind current system that brings them right across the Atlantic Ocean and into the Caribbean. And it is actually possible to detect sand from the Sahara, based on its chemical composition, in some of the islands in the Caribbean. You wonder, why is there all this fine dust on the leaves? Where does this dust all come from? It turns out some of it actually traveled across the Pacific. And so it's that kind of an effect that has a scale that's much beyond a single ecosystem. Now, as a consequence of having to deal with 
all these interesting levels, and especially the changes in the abiotic factors in the environment, which we'll talk about in a minute, organisms have a series of adaptations. And when you're looking at the kinds of adaptations that an organism like you and I would have to withstand the effects of a certain environment, then you would have to look, first of all, at the organism's physiology. So there are a variety of physiological adaptations. Let's say, for example, you wish to live in the desert. That means you have to deal with the lack of water. Somehow your physiology needs to be adapted so that even though there is not much standing water around, you can survive, right? That's pretty standard stuff. If you are living in seawater, and of course, a lot of organisms live in seawater, many of them the ones that you've been studying for your diversity PowerPoints, then they have to be able to deal with a water that's salty enough that it's more salty than the cells of the organisms may be. So you think of a saltwater fish, the saltwater fish has blood that's less saline, that has a lower concentration of salts than the salt water right outside. And so the fish obviously has to have some physiological adaptations to deal with that so that its water, the water in itself, doesn't leave the cells. There are then also some anatomical adaptations. And anything that helps an organism deal with these various factors in the environment can be anatomical. If it's too cold, add a layer of fur. If it's too warm, maybe you shouldn't have a lot of fur to begin with. Or perhaps you need some adaptations to catch the prey. And if you're a prey item, maybe you need some adaptations to avoid being eaten. So all of these kind of things can be anatomical, and we'll review them a little bit in the later chapter. And then lastly, there are some behavioral adaptations. Now, behavioral adaptations are, of course, limited to organisms that can actually behave. And so when you're considering this, it doesn't really apply to plants. But you'll find that there are a lot of organisms that migrate. They move. And sometimes these are large-scale migrations. If you think of things like the monarch butterflies or birds that have seasonal migrations, whales have seasonal migrations, but it also simply means if it gets too hot in the sun, move to the shade. So those are all behavioral responses to changes in the environment. Some of these changes are large-scale <coughs> seasons and some of them are day-to-day. -day. So there are a lot of things that go into this. But what are the abiotic factors that drive some of this, that drive the composition of some of these um, communities of organisms? So let's review some of the abiotic factors. Now, some key abiotic factors are those that you could not live without, no matter where you live. So one of the key ones is energy. One of the things that I spoke about in terms of energy is without energy we have nothing and so mitochondria are extremely important to large <laughs> organisms like ourselves. So energy is obviously critical. Ultimately, we derive our energy from sunlight. Now that doesn't mean for you and I that we gain any energy by simply standing outside in the parking lot and warming up. We need to do it differently we need to actually find organisms that can obtain the energy from just standing around, and we have to eat them. So we are one step removed from sunlight, but if you think about what you eat on a day-to-day -day basis, chances are you do eat your greens, your veggies, your you know, plant products, but then you may also have some products that you eat that are sort of one-off, one in between. If you eat you know, butter, cheese, milk, that's from the cow doesn't mean you eat the cow, but it means the cow had to eat the grass in order to put the energy into the milk, and into the, you know, the fat, and so on, and so it's one step removed. Now, you also have a geothermal source. There aren't that many organisms that can tap into that geothermal source. There are some, 
there aren't that many. And as we heard in our discussion of evolution, some of those may actually be entirely different kinds of things. But it is interesting that we share the planet with organisms that can do all kinds of different things. Now the next kind of uh, factor that's very influential in terms of where organisms can live is temperature. And temperature is deliberately listed in my list at number two because temperature is something that over the last uh, decades, two decades really, we have observed shifting. Now, whatever the cause of this, this is not what I'm trying to get into, but when the temperature shifts, some organisms have to shift with it. To give you an example, in Central America, there are a variety of mountain ranges. And these mountain ranges tend to be islands in the sky. So they have the Pacific and the Caribbean lowlands that are surrounding a series of volcanoes that run pretty much through the center of Central America. Costa Rica is famous for this, Nicaragua, they all have really famous volcanoes. And on the tips of these volcanoes, you'll find that the environment is quite a bit different than it is on the lowlands. And so that's why we call them islands in the sky, because on top, you find that the characteristics of the environment are actually a lot different than they are below. Now, as the, the, the continent warms, and as the temperature increases, you'll find that the organisms that like the cooler areas near the mountaintops, perhaps cloud forests or montane forests, they will find that their habitat decreases because the temperature gets a little bit warmer, and so they, there's less of an area left for them to be in that cooler place. Now eventually, if you just keep warming, keep warming, keep warming, then you'll find that there is no more cloud forest, and if that entire habitat disappears, then some of the species will disappear with it. To give you a concrete example from my own research, there is something called the golden tree frog. And it's a tree frog that coexists with a particular kind of bromeliad. Bromeliads are plants that need to live in very moist environments, and they themselves hold water in the, the leaf axils, and that's where these frogs like to hang out. And the bromeliad provides shelter, provides moisture, and a lot of things will climb into the bromeliad to find water and the frog can eat them. So it's a really nice place for the frog to hang out. Well, they only cooperate like this with one species of bromeliad. And that species of bromeliad exists on about seven or eight mountaintops in northern Venezuela, Trinidad, and the Margarita Island. Well, on all of these, the tallest mountains have plenty of this habitat. Plenty of the habitat means that it's a habitat per mountaintop of the size of this campus. But on Margarita Island, where the mountain is the one that has the least elevation, you'll find that there's only about an, a patch of cloud forest left that's the size of this building. So that's not very much now, is it? And so as a consequence of that, you'll find that that, that that species, both the bromelia as well as the frog, they're literally running out of space. And it's because of their particular temperature requirements. Next, which goes along with that temperature requirement to some degree, is water. The problems with water are, are many. I mean, water is obviously something we all need. We have problems with dehydration and so on. And so clearly, if you have too little water, that's a problem. But at the same time, if you have too much water, that can also be a problem. You can actually overhydrate. Organisms can overhydrate. And then, of course, if it's not the right salinity, that could also be a problem. So you have too little, too much, too salty, there's all kinds of issues with water. And so water sometimes strictly limits where organisms can be found. Then, of course, we have nutrients. And in terms of nutrients, you'll find that uh, these nutrients are determined by the environment that you surround yourself with. So if you need acidic soil, then that's where you need to live. And if the soil nearby is not acidic, then you're not going to go there. So, for example, soil is going to be important. 
But also, there are things that happen in, in rivers. And this is really interesting because in rivers, you would think, well, it's a river. You can go up, upstream by boat, and you go downstream by boat as you wish. There are no barriers. But you would be mistaken because even in rivers, where the water flows from one direction to another, it doesn't flow uphill, right? So it flows only one direction. You'll find that there are actual different uh, nutrient zones in a flowing river. And that's because as the river flows, it will pick up whatever is on the banks and underneath. And that's what the river is going to carry with it for a while until it gets mixed up with the next soil layers. And so if you're looking for a particular type of river that's pure and clean and it doesn't have much dissolved nutrient mass in it at all, then you might go to a place where the river runs across rocky terrain and it's clear and it's pristine and there's no muck in it, no mud, not many leaves. This is the kind of thing you find in mountain streams. And that same river or stream will go downhill with no visible barrier to the water flow, but once you get a little bit lower down, then it's gonna pick up nutrients from leaves perhaps. Deciduous forests, the leaves fall down in the winter time, and so you now have a nutrient load with all these leaves. Eventually they settle down at the bottom and they produce a certain amount of mud. If that, in addition to loamy soils from the banks, is going to feed into the river, then you're going to end up having a lot of mud. And the river is going to change from something that's clear to something that's muddy. Meaning that if you put on a, a mask and you look in the river, you have no visibility. And so you can find that in rivers there are significant changes and so pH and nutrient load are really important when it comes to nutrients. One of the characteristics that is often overlooked is wind. Now wind actually has a lot of effects. Wind affects the growth of organisms. If there is a consistent wind going in a certain direction, then the growth of the organisms would tend to indicate that. It's also very important in many cases for the dispersal of organisms. Think about what happens with things like seeds or pollen grains. Those need to be distributed somehow, right? And so this is important. And lastly, wind can also be critical in moving dust and soil. Wind actually is one of the most important features in shifting soil from one place to the next, including sometimes from mainland, from continental land masses to islands. Now it takes a while for the wind to blow a significant amount of soil across, but not that much. And so to give an example, in the 1970s, there was an undersea volcano that erupted near Iceland and it produced an island called Circe. And this island literally was just a black volcanic mass for several years. But within a few years, you found that even in this inhospitable environment where there was nothing to begin with, grasses started to grow. Grass seeds are light, they need a little bit of moisture and just a little bit of nutrish, nutritious dust or dirt to settle in and of course if you have a volcanic landmass then the rain and the changes in the seasons, snow melt, all those kind of things are going to produce these tiny tiny pockets of a very fine soil and for grasses that's enough. Now once you have the grass growing then a lot more of this dust is going to get stuck on the grass blades and it's going to start producing more soil. So ultimately wind literally is very important for soil formation. It is also important for removing soils. Erosion, you've probably heard of, and in some places erosion is a critical feature in shaping the environment as well. And then you have, as a consequence of the wind perhaps, you have disturbances. Now when it comes to wind, some of these are pretty obvious. So you have things like hurricanes. You have tornadoes. You have a variety of things that are 
wind type disturbances. You also, of course, have a variety of disturbances that are geological, things like earthquakes, landslides, or volcanism. So you have a variety of disturbances, and really the best way to figure out what kind of disturbance you're dealing with is to classify them into random versus regular, or let's call it periodic. Now, periodic disturbances would be the kinds of things you'd expect with the seasons. Um, we tend to have hurricane season. <coughs> the beginning of hurricane season is June 1st, and it goes until June, uh, excuse me, November 30th. Now, this is the Atlantic hurricane season. It doesn't exactly work that way with typhoons and cyclones in the Pacific, but there still is some seasonality. And so those you would consider periodic. <clears throat> Flooding is a disturbance. Flooding occurs mostly because either of heavy rainfall or because of snow melt. And so you can account for that. And then there are things that are random in terms of when they occur. Earthquakes tend to be random when they occur, though not where. We know that there is around the Pacific Rim a more active earthquake zone than in some other parts of the world. And so it's random not from a perspective of geography, but it's <coughs> random from when exactly they happen. Things like landslides, of course, could in some cases be uh, more periodic if they're related to snowmelt and, and rainfall. Um, but you do find that there are some simply random things. If you think of fire, sometimes fires happen because of lightning. And so um, the place and the timing is pretty random for those. So there's a series of abiotic factors that ultimately determines where organisms can live. And so now we can shift from chapter 18, which is the general uh, introduction to ecology and some of the factors that go into it, we can shift to chapter 19, which is the one dealing with populations. So that's the first video.